Welcome to the Commonweal Theatre Company's production of Hedda Gobbler by Henrik Ibsen. This production is the twelfth in our ongoing commitment to producing the works of Norway's greatest playwright. Written in 1889, Hedda Gobbler has received more productions than any of his works. What have audiences found so fascinating in this portrait of a talented, intelligent, driven woman whose life becomes a picture of frustration? What makes Hedda a masterwork of modern drama? To answer these questions and look at some of the forces at work in Ibsen's plays, we welcome Hal Kropp, Artistic Director of the Commonwealth Theatre Company and 2009 nominee for the International Ibsen Award. In looking at the works of Henrik Ibsen, it's important to understand the forces at play in the 19th century, forces that helped shape Ibsen's thoughts and his works. Chief among these are the rise of nationalism, the emergence of women's suffrage as a popular cause, and the appearance of naturalism as a response to the romantic artistic movement of the early 19th century. Let's look at nation building first. The proclamation of the French Republic in 1848 led to the second French Revolution, which in turn led to violent outbreaks in the major cities across Europe, from Vienna and Berlin to Milan and Rome. People were up in arms and decided to embrace the concept of building their own nations. Out of this movement, Germany, Italy, Austria, Hungary, and the Balkan empires emerged, nations that we recognize today. Norway was not left out of this fervor. After 400 years under Danish rule, Norwegian life had come to be appropriated by the Danes. Education and much of literature was written in Danish. And as their compatriots across Europe embraced the concept of nationalism, Norwegians too began to clamor for their own language and their own culture. This led Norwegian anthropologists and sociologists to begin to collect artifacts, folk tales, and create a catalog of Norwegian folk traditions and the Norwegian languages spoke in various provinces throughout the country. It was in this atmosphere that Ibsen found himself when he finally finished his apprenticeship in Grimstad and moved to Christiania to study for the university. Indeed, many of his close friends and compatriots were heavily involved in this drive to create a Norwegian language and a culture. And indeed, Ole Bull, the famous violinist, decided to found a Norwegian language theater in the town of Bergen and hired Ibsen to be its stage manager, or literally its theater director. Here, for six years of his life, Ibsen found himself, at last, immersed in the world of theater, staging plays written by Danish playwrights, Swedish playwrights, and French playwrights, and writing his own plays. He began to find his voice. The next seven years of his life, he spent running the Norwegian language theater in Christiania, and when it foundered, and he had a fight with its board of directors, he gave up theater altogether. In 1863, he left Norway not to return for another 29 years in 1891. By the latter half of the 19th century, women's suffrage, indeed women's rights, became a huge issue for societies all across Europe. Norway was no exception. Artists, politicians, statesmen, all took up the cry to extend to women the rights that men had enjoyed for centuries. But it wasn't until 1907, a year after Ibsen's death, that Norway extended the right to vote to women. Norway was indeed the first country in Europe and the first in the Western civilization to extend such a right. Ibsen himself, though women sit at the heart of most of his work, disavowed any specific link to feminism. I have been more of a poet and less of a social philosopher than people generally tend to suppose. It is, incidentally, desirable to solve the problem of women, but that has not been my whole object. My task has been the portrayal of human beings. He did, however, maintain a very cordial correspondence with Camille Collette, an uh, early and staunch advocate of women's rights and the right for women to vote in Norway. The third major influence on Ibsen and his work was the rise of naturalism in the arts. In the 19th century, the arts had been swept up in the Romantic movement, bold, loud, wild, gestural work filled music, art, and literature. Naturalism emerged in part because of three scientific advances in the middle of the 19th century. In 1859, Charles Darwin wrote of his evolutionary theory of biology in The Origin of the Species. In 1865, 
Claude Bernard published the Introduction to the Experimental Study of Human Medicine. And in 1869, Frederick Engels and Karl Marx published their groundbreaking social analysis of economic theory, Das Kapital. This led thinkers across Europe to desire an art form that could express the issues and fast-changing understanding of their environment. So naturalism was born. In the theater, naturalism led to incredible technological breakthroughs. Uh, in scenery, the settings became much more realistic and lifelike. Indeed, uh, André Antoine in th at the Théâtre Libre in France created an entire French butcher shop complete with blood-soaked sawdust on the stage for a play. Lighting, too, changed from a general wash of illumination to the ability to narrowly isolate pockets of light on stage with the invention of the carbon arc and limelight. The subject matter in naturalism shifted from a study of nobility and heroic tradition written in verse to an examination of the everyday written in everyday language of prose. Here it was that Ibsen found his voice. This then is the background from which Ibsen will emerge as the father of modern drama. In 1877, in exile, he begins to write a series of plays which many consider his social problem plays. They lay out what he thinks of as the foundation for his work in the theater. The conflict between one's aims and one's abilities, between what man purposes and what is actually possible, constituting at once both the tragedy and the comedy of mankind and of the individual. From this desire, Ibsen writes Doll's House, which looks at the woman's rights in society, Ghosts, an examination of, among other things, the church's role in prescribing morality for the individual. Enemy of the people, what is the people's benefit versus what is the need to know the truth. The wild duck, what is the cost of the pursuit of truth at any expense. Then, in Munich, Ibsen writes three plays focusing on the relationship between men and women. His Munich plays look at marriage, whether traditional or not, from a very specific perspective. Rosmersholm deals with what happens when communication is not clearly linked with intent and the negative impact on the relationship between the man and the woman. The Lady from the Sea looks at how it's possible to embrace responsibility and commitment and whether or not that can indeed succeed in real life. And finally, Hedda Gabler, which is an intense examination of what happens when a woman's desires, her talents, her strengths, and her will are given no appropriate outlet in society or in her personal life. With Hedda, Ibsen is able to shape the question that will dog him through his final four plays. If our whole being is nothing but a fight against the dark forces within ourselves, what is the role of will? At this point in Ibsen's career, he moves beyond his desire to examine the questions of every day and begins to seek difficult questions to what it means to be human. What is the interior journey of humanity and how can that be expressed? It is not what we experience that matters, but how we understand it. Out of this then emerges what many consider to be his finest play. Tautly constructed, with exposition skillfully interwoven throughout the dramatic action, this marvel of craftsmanship cements Ibsen's reputation as the father of modern drama and launches him on an exploration of the interiority of the human condition which will serve as the basis for much of modern art. Enjoy. <laughs>